is Calvin Sharp, and I am the director of Sister. I have a voice disorder, and I am using speech-assistive technology to promote clarity. A number of you have been following Sister since its inception in 2005. So, you will recall that among the four distinguished lectures, that we do annually, one is devoted to some discipline other than law that has much to say about conflict and dispute resolution. We have had a poet, a bioethicist, a political scientist, and today we have a preeminent social psychologist. He is truly one of the world's most influential social psychologists. He is actually a child of Cleveland, having been born here and having taught at this university after receiving his Ph.D. from Princeton in 1978, where he studied under a pioneering social psychologist. Unfortunately, we lost him in 2003 when he went to Florida State to spearhead a graduate program in social psychology. He has written over 450 publications, including 28 books. According to the Institute for Scientific Information, his research has been cited over 12,000 times by other scientists, making him, as I said at the outset, one of the world's most influential psychologists. He is currently funded by the NIH and the Templeton Foundation. Currently, he is working on a book with Brad Bushman titled Social Psychology and Human Nature, but he's here today to talk about how rejection affects people. Please join me in welcoming the EPS Eminent Scholar and Professor of Psychology at Florida State University, Roy F. Bomeister. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate the invitation and the chance to come back to uh, wonderful Cleveland. All right, my uh, topic is on how people are affected by rejection. This is work that I started actually when I was uh, working just down the street here and have continued. Uh, at Florida State. The basic idea that we started with uh, is that uh, one of the key defining features of, of human nature and motivation is what we call the need to belong. Uh, that there's a fundamental pervasive drive uh, that people want to be connected uh, to others to form and maintain uh, meaningful important relationships. This is pretty much universal uh, and that it uh, underlies a great deal of, of thinking, feeling patterns, behavior, uh, highly related to mental and physical health and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so we thought, well, what happens if this is such a basic, uh, powerful need? Uh, what happens when it is thwarted? What happens when people are, are rejected? Uh, and uh, my method is, is typically working, looking at this in a very limited sense in, in laboratory studies. Uh, so uh, the effects uh, presumably are smaller than what it would be like being rejected out in, uh, out in the real world. Uh, nonetheless, we can uh, carefully control and, and look at the effects of rejection. So uh, we reasoned that uh, need to belong is very important. Therefore, rejection should be upsetting. Uh, we have emotions mainly to uh, uh, tell us about things that are relevant to, the th to uh, things that, uh, that are basic motivations. So blocking a basic need should uh, cause emotional distress uh, and that in turn would cause behavioral effects. So our basic theory was uh, the bottom line here. Uh, that was rejection would cause emotion, uh, which in turn would cause behavior. Now, let me describe how we uh, work with this uh, in the laboratory, and I make no claim that this is the, the only way or the best way or anything to study these phenomena. Uh, that is uh, just one way. In, in social science, you need all the methods uh, uh, to look for converging evidence. Uh, our, our findings converge very well with other studies that, that look at lonely people out in the world and so on. But uh, uh, let me describe uh, just what uh, some of those methods are. Um, so uh, in one set of studies, we would invite uh, maybe half a dozen people to a laboratory experiment at a time. Uh, we'd have them sit around and get to know each other, give them some things to talk about to uh, reveal a bit of themselves. And they say, okay, now that you've gotten to know each other, the next part of the experiment, we want you to pair off. Uh, so everybody lists the two people in the group that you just met that you'd most like uh, to work with. And then we put people into separate rooms. Uh, collect all their lists of who they want to work with. We throw those away. Uh, and then uh, by random assignment, we go around from room to room and say, oh, well, uh, this has never happened before, uh, but uh, nobody chose you. 
uh, as someone they wanted to work with. Or in the other condition, we say everybody chose you. And in both cases, we say, well, we want people to work with somebody who did and somebody who didn't chose them. Uh, and you're, uh, this is unusual, but you don't fit that, so we're going to have you do something else. And then we can go on and measure whatever we want to. So by random assignment, uh, people are uh, told that they were accepted or rejected by uh, this group of people that they just met. And an important point, too, uh, unlike, say, tracking lonely people out in the world, and you never know, are they lonely because of them, uh, or are they, uh, are they lonely for arbitrary reasons, and the, uh, the other patterns they might show would be the result uh, of their loneliness. Here, uh, with an experiment, you can show that rejection is the cause, because they're randomly assigned, uh, which means that differences among people will average out in, a, in fairly short order. A different procedure that we use in some of the other studies uh, is we have people take a personality test, and this one is convenient because we can run people one at a time, uh, and then uh, when uh, they finish filling that out, we take it away and pretend we get the computer to analyze it and so on, and then we give them some feedback and you have, we give them you know, a few valid points about uh, what was on the questionnaire to give them uh, some validity, uh, and then we hit them with the big thing. We say, oh, one more thing. Uh, the statistical profile shows that uh, people who look like you will tend to end up alone in life. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, that, uh, and, and we know many people have friends now, so to make it plausible, we say, well, uh, lots of people have friends when they're your age and you're constantly meeting new people, but as you get out of college, uh, you'll be less likely uh, to meet others and your friends will drift away and you'll be spending more and more time alone. Um, I should add, uh, you know, we're concerned we don't want to uh, freak people out or anything, uh, so we only leave people in this state for about 10 or 15 minutes. We very quickly give a thorough debriefing, we're very careful, and, and you know, it turns out nobody's harmed by this, but we were sensitive to it. Uh, we make sure, you know, look, it was a random assignment. If you'd been in the other condition, you would have gotten this feedback, uh, which uh, uh, in, the, in the acceptance condition, we tell them uh, uh, you'll be, for the rest of your life, you'll be surrounded by people who love you and care about you. Um, and the value of this procedure, we have a couple other ones. We think being told that uh, you're going to end up alone in life is, is probably bad news for most people. Uh, so is the effects that we might observe just because of bad news in general, or is it specific to rejection? So we had what we called the misfortune control group, uh, where we tell them our statistical profile indicates as you get older, uh, you'll, have, you'll become more and more accident prone. And so you'll be spending a lot of time in, a, in uh, emergency rooms, and you have broken bones and things like that. And of course, that's bad. Uh, too, but that way we can separate the effects from bad news in general to something specific about uh, uh, rejection. And then there's a, a no feedback control. Uh, there's one other procedure we use sometimes, which is we have two people, well, essentially two people, actually one comes in, uh, but they, they believe they're going to meet someone else, and they say, well, you want me to make a video uh, to introduce yourself to the other person, so just talk a little bit about yourself uh, for the camera. And then we take that away and show, ostensibly to show it to the other person, and then the experimenter comes back and says, oh, uh, the other person left. And by random assignment, it's either uh, the other person left because he or she, and it's always the same gender uh, as the, the subject, the other person uh, had an appointment, was late for, and couldn't stay, or after looking at your video, the person decided they didn't want to meet you. Uh, so it's a very personal rejection. It's clearly something about you, something you said uh, that uh, turned the person off. All right. All right, uh, now just to give a, a summary of uh, what the early work showed when we started doing these things, plenty of behavioral effects, uh, but uh, the emotion was hard to find. Remember, our theory was rejection would be upsetting uh, and would produce behavior. In, in, intuitively, when people hear about these procedures and imagine them, they say, oh, if that happened to me, I would be so upset. I'd be uh, you know, really weeping in my, my beer, if not my shoes. Um, but uh, actually, we measured emotion all different ways, and uh, we didn't find any sign of it. Now, it could be that the emotional reaction was delayed, but regardless, the behavior was not delayed. The behavior effects occurred right away. Uh, and so that, so our basic theory that I put up was, was wrong, that uh, it would go from rejection to emotion to behavior. Uh, that's clearly not what happened. Now let me summarize some of the behavior effects, uh, and I think they make sense, and then we'll get into what's going on inside the person. So uh, one thing, very consistent, strong effect across multiple experiments, uh, the rejected people become increasingly aggressive. Uh, we, uh, they don't let us give electric shocks uh, in the laboratory anymore, uh, but people would play games with someone else where the, the slower person would get blasted with loud noise and you could set if you won, how loud a noise would the other person get. And, and so that's uh, aversive stimulation, people don't want it. There are various other procedures uh, you can use to measure aggression, but uh, regardless, the, the same effect. The rejected people became more aggressive and in all cases, it wouldn't be surprising, perhaps, if they're aggressive toward the people who rejected them. But remember, we take them away to interact with new people. 
Uh, the new person may have criticized or insulted them. Then they're quite uh, aggressive. So they're rejected by one person. Uh, they're ready to attack somebody else if the person criticizes them. Uh, that's uh, not too surprising, perhaps uh, uh, a little bit more alarming. They're even more aggressive toward an innocent person who has not insulted them, has not offended or provoked them in any way. Uh, and that's quite unusual in the laboratory aggression research. Most aggression research, you can only get, these are mostly college student subjects, you only get people to be aggressive towards somebody if the person provokes them or insults them in some way. Uh, but uh, if they've been rejected by somebody else, they're already uh, inclined to be more aggressive. The only uh, exception was if the new person had praised them and given them some positive feedback, uh, then we did not see an increase in aggression. They weren't exceptionally nice either. Uh, so they were not less aggressive than the controls, but at least there was no, uh, no increase there. Um, so uh, the, uh, the uh, increase in aggression was not linked. Again, there was no sign of more frustration, more anger, no other emotion. Uh, they would just deliver louder blasts of noise, more unpleasant stimulation of whatever sort. Uh, toward uh, these, uh, these new people. Uh, so in a sense, you're rejected, you get a, a chip on your shoulder. And to put it in perspective, you'd think if you got rejected, people aren't liking you, you should be nicer to other people. Uh, you know, ask what, you're, what are you doing and, 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 and turn around to become nice, but instead they seem to have a, an attitude, a chip on their shoulder, uh, and are ready uh, to lash out at the next person who comes along at, at a slight provocation or even with no provocation. Um, we did other studies to look for helping. Do people become more helpful? And this clearly, I mean, you'd think if you're rejected, ideally you should uh, uh, go and be nicer and helpful uh, to other people. Uh, but uh, study after study, there was no sign of being helpful. We asked them to donate to the student emergency fund to help other students in need. Nope, they wouldn't uh, donate anything. Well, we thought maybe that's abstract, the person's not there. Uh, how about if the experimenter asks them for a favor? There's a high status person wanting you. Would you stay and do some more experiments? No. Nope. Uh, no sign of that. Okay, well maybe that's too big a commitment. They, uh, they think they want to get going or get out of that situation. Uh, so in third condition, when the experimenter is giving the feedback, they a jar of pencils and just the experimenter pretends to knock it over and the, the pencils fall over on the floor. So all the person has to do is reach down and pick up a few pencils. But no, they wouldn't do that either. I mean, the, the, the control condition, you know, they got down their hands and knees and helped pick up the pencils and here's another one and so on. Uh, I think they averaged, uh, the, re the rejected people averaged half a pencil. Uh, you know, uh, across the whole experiment. Uh, so they really couldn't be bothered even just to bend down to be helpful. Uh, so anyway, the pro-social, Mr. Nice Guy uh, sort of behavior seemed to go out the window. Uh, we looked for uh, self-defeating behavior too, and uh, that was on the increase. Uh, uh, they showed signs, that various ways in the lab of measuring self-destructive behavior. Uh, one is taking foolish risks that are objectively, you know, you have a risk option and a play it safe option. Um, and you can make the risk option objectively worse, which we did. Uh, people who had been accepted, neutrals and so on, they figured out the play it safe was the right way to go. Uh, the rejected people know they would tend to go for the high risk, high payoff, uh, uh, but, but poor, uh, poor outcome. Again, they made unhealthy choices, uh, take the easy, lazy way out. They would procrastinate rather than study for an upcoming test. Uh, so uh, a variety of things indicating a rise in self-defeating behavior. And this is a little surprising because you could look at the pro-social behavior and say, all right, they're just being selfish. If they're being rejected, uh, maybe they're uh, being more selfish. Uh, but they're selfish and self-defeating, which is an unusual combination. I want to come back to uh, what that might mean uh, in a couple of minutes. So anyway, there's a set of the uh, behavioral effects we got for rejection. Uh, the issue is, is that uh, emotion was not mediating it. Something must be going on inside these people to produce these big changes in, uh, in behavior. Uh, so what are the, uh, the inner processes? All right, well, uh, ruling out emotion, and we'd tried all sorts of different emotion measures and, and nothing had worked out. Uh, so uh, what other sorts of things? Well, one thing is, is intelligence. Uh, we looked for intelligent thought. And you know, being rejected or excluded seems to make you stupid, at least for a short period of time. It's like getting hit on the head with a, a brick, perhaps. Uh, we gave people an IQ test, a uh, short form of it, uh, after they'd uh, gotten the rejection feedback and remarkable drops in scores. Um, now, not all mental operations were impaired. It seems like the, the difficult ones where you have to put in effort to manage your thinking, uh, things like logical reasoning where you go from one thing to another, those things showed significant uh, impairments and decrements. Um, rote memory, that sort of thing, uh, seemed to be fine. Uh, psychologists distinguish automatic from controlled uh, mental processes. Uh, the automatic ones seemed to be unimpaired. 
Uh, for example, IQ tests often have a vocabulary test, uh, and it's valid because smart people know more words than stupid people. Well, your vocabulary is still the same after you've been rejected. It's not how, like, you, you forget all your three-syllable three words that you know. Uh, that, you, that part is still fine. Uh, you can even read new uh, in, information and answer directly uh, questions that directly assess the content of what you're reading. Uh, but if you have a reading comprehension where you have to reason and uh, extrapolate or infer or deduce or whatever, then uh, people did substantially worse. So suggests that the, uh, the impairment uh, in rejection is something in the controlled processes, uh, you might call the executive function of the mind that, that manages things uh, rather than its uh, automatic operations. And again, all this, no sign of uh, emotional distress. All right. Well, the fact that it's control processes then led me, led me to wonder, uh, could this be a deficit in, in self-regulation? Because that's one of the executive processes by which the self manages itself. I'd had uh, a separate research program uh, on uh, self-control and self-regulation. Uh, that uh, So we had plenty of procedures, and I hadn't really thought of these as, as related at all, but uh, it looked like there might be something there. So well, let's try and see if self-regulation is somehow worse than. And, uh, Going back to the point that they were both selfish and self-defeating, uh, that would be a sign of poor self-control because uh, when your self-regulation, self-control breaks down, then you become both more selfish uh, because you're kind of impulsive and just doing things for yourself and we need self-control to be nicer to others and be a good citizen. Uh, but uh, you're also very short-term focused and a lot of the recipe for self-defeating behavior is uh, impulsively going for short-term gain and, uh, and getting long-term costs. So, uh, self-regulation, if it worked, would, would resolve that seeming paradox. So, uh, first study, uh, and this was the group manipulation. Again, by random assignment, nobody chose you or everybody show you. And as you see, uh, the rejected people ate uh, almost twice as many cookies uh, uh, there, uh, as, as the others. And most students, uh, this was still done in here, most students agree that you shouldn't eat too many cookies, they're bad for you and so forth, uh, but they ate them uh, anyway. There was some dispute as to whether the cookies actually tasted better to the uh, rejected uh, <laughs> people, uh, but statistically that was unrelated. Uh, you know, to the extent there was a higher liking for them, that, that didn't predict how many they ate. And we had a couple people say things like, I, I don't really like these cookies, but I can't seem to stop uh, chomping them down. Um, well, uh, you know, a Freudian interpretation, maybe that stimulates some kind of oral thing. Uh, cookies are bad for you, but they taste good. So the next study, we look for something that's good for you, but tastes bad. Uh, called this uh, taking your medicine. It was mixed with uh, vinegar and some other things which are actually quite healthy. Uh, and again, encouraged people to consume as much as they could. Well, there the rejected people uh, consumed less. So it, it's not uh, that rejection makes you hungry or any, in any sense. Uh, again, suggests a deficit in self-control, that you're not regulating your behavior to do what you should. Uh, you're instead being more uh, impulsive. Uh, we measure sometimes uh, self-regulation by how long do people keep trying uh, before they give up on, on puzzles which are actually rigged to be unsolvable. Uh, again, the future alone people uh, quit significantly faster than all the others. And notice, this, notice the misfortune control. It's not just hearing bad news. And these people were told, as you get older, you'll be spending more time in emergency rooms, have a lot of broken bones, stuff like that. I mean, that, that's not a nice picture of your future, but it did not seem to impair your self-regulation. They, they persisted just as long as, uh, uh, as the others. The one that's really different is the ones who are told you're going you're gonna to end up alone and have, uh, have no friends at some point later in life. Um, yet another, I got this, uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Chicago uh, studies lonely people, and he said, uh, lonely people have trouble controlling their attention. The, the dichotic listening task is, is one uh, that they do where you put on headphones and you have different things in different ears. And in one ear you're hearing a speech, and in the other ear you're hearing a list of words. And we say, well, you're supposed to listen to those words and record all the ones that have either the letter M or the letter P, which means you have to screen out that speech that's going there and just uh, concentrate on those list of words and evaluate them. Uh, he said lonely people were bad at that, but he didn't know maybe they're bad listeners, which is why they're lonely, because nobody li But no, uh, <laughs> the, by doing an experiment like this, we could show that rejection causes that. So you know, randomly chosen people, we tell them you're going to end up alone in life. And if they're not even lonely now, just, just at some point you'll lose your friends. Uh, that's enough to produce significant impairment in, uh, in their ability to execute uh, that task. So uh, self-regulation is impaired among rejected persons, uh, and again, uh, irrelevant to emotional distress. Now, why this happens, we wondered about that. We had a variety of theories. Why should rejected people show poorer self-control? 
Uh, is it that they have less awareness of themselves, because self-awareness is a vital ingredient in effective self-control? Uh, is that their willpower is depleted, which was an you know, important uh, contributor to self-control failure emerging from my other work? Uh, does uh, rejection somehow pull the plug and make the system uh, temporarily collapse? Uh, are they sort of uh, disoriented, like, uh, like I said, like somebody bonked them on the head? Uh, are they somehow just not wanting to bother? Uh, we had this elaborate idea, the implicit bargain, uh, which is that to participate in society, uh, you have to restrain your, uh, your desires and to, to some extent. I mean, you go to a restaurant and somebody else has food that looks good to you, you can't just grab it off their, uh, their table and eat it yourself. Uh, and in general, going through life, uh, restraining yourself, so living up to rules and obeying laws and so forth, uh, that's a significant uh, you know, part of uh, the effectiveness of civilization. So we thought, well, there are costs uh, to doing that, to restraining your desires, but there's payoff, which is that you belong to the, the group, and, uh, um, um, and, and so you get the rewards of belongingness in the long run. But the bargain can perhaps break down on either side. Certainly people who self-regulate poorly uh, get excluded. Uh, their partners break up with them, their employers fire them, uh, society puts them in prison. Uh, poor self-control, one of the major causes of uh, crim criminal lifestyle, as you know. Um, so uh, people who don't self-regulate uh, get rejected. Uh, but what about the, uh, would it go the other way too? Uh, would rejection cause poor self-regulation? I mean, this would imply that they could still self-regulate if they wanted to. So we, uh, we tried that. Uh, in one case, we manipulated their self-awareness. Remember, self-awareness was an ingredient. Uh, so uh, we manipulate that, we just put a mirror in front of people. Uh, and then they're doing the dichotic listening task. You know, a mirror should be a distractor, but no, it actually, uh, they did. Let I me mean, look at that 42.6. Uh, the people where the mirror was there, suddenly uh, they did better again. So excluded people seem to be capable of, of good self-control, at least if we, you know, start the process by uh, making them highly self-aware. Uh, we also tried offering them money. Uh, again, they did, uh, did much better than, uh, so again, showing that they could self-regulate if they had a selfish reason to do so. If we offer them uh, more money for if they get most of those words correct, uh, suddenly they can focus in pretty well. Uh, so that suggests they can self-regulate, they just don't want to. It's more of a why bother, why bother to heck with you attitude. Um, um, so, uh, a self -incentive, a selfish incentive, and, and again, the uh, imp implication is they're unwilling rather than unable uh, to self-regulate. Um, that made us think uh, one other thing is what if we offer people a chance to be rejected or, or a chance to be accepted again. If the rejected people find out that uh, uh, this next test is going to uh, measure something that might help them uh, be uh, socially accepted, would they suddenly do well at it? Um, so um, we, we, we Gave people the manipulation that you're going to be alone in life or you're going to be uh, loved uh, throughout your life and surrounded by people who care about you. And then we gave them the test of self-regulation. Half we told them this is a, a measure of your future health, which is important, but it's, it's not acceptance. And the other we said this is a test of your social skills. Uh, so if you do well on the test, then you'll make friends and be healthy. Um, and the, the Stroop task, so here low scores are, are good. Uh, the Stroop task is the, the color word thing where the, you see the word red printed in green and you have to say the color of the word rather than the meaning. So you have to override the impulse to say red and say green. Um, so anyway, the lower scores the better. Uh, as, uh, as you see with the white, white bars, uh, uh, the effect is eliminated if we tell people that this test is a test of your social skills, the ability to understand others, read between the lines and so forth. If we tell them that it's a diagnostic of their future physical health, then we just get the usual effect that rejected people do a lot worse than others. So yes, there does seem to be a desire to reconnect uh, in there. So, so far, self-regulation self impaired among rejected persons. They're unwilling, not unable. Um, and uh, they do want to get accepted if uh, they can get some positive sign, uh, perhaps in, the, in this easy way. Uh, so all this kind of supports that implicit bargain uh, idea that People self-regulate in order to be accepted. If you tell them you're going to be rejected and alone in life, then why should I bother trying to be a good person and controlling myself and, and living up to the norms and laws of society? Um, now, this desire to reconnect that's there, it turns out, if there's such desiring to reconnect, remember, why are they antisocial? Why aren't they helping people? Why didn't they bend down and pick up the pencils for the experimenter? Uh, but uh, you know, my sense is uh, that rejected people 
would like to be accepted, but they mainly they don't want to be rejected again. <laughs> uh, so they don't want to take a chance, they don't want to put themselves out there. Uh, if you offer them some risk-free man manner of uh, connecting with others, like all they have to do is do well on the Stroop test, then, uh, uh, then they'll go for that. But uh, if they have to take a chance that might involve being rejected again, then they're not so willing to do that. Um, and we have a variety of evidence supporting that. Uh, uh, one uh, paper showed that uh, your rejected persons, looking at how they spend money, they'd spend more money than other people uh, to buy connective type of items, uh, school spirit wristbands that uh, had the university's name on it. Uh, yeah, the rejected people were more likely to, to spend their actual money to buy these. Uh, practical things and self-gift kinds of items, no, there was no difference in spending that, so they're not spending more money uh, on, on other things that seem specifically targeted towards something that would symbolize uh, acceptance. Uh, if they're going to meet somebody else, uh, they would spend in ways that matched the spending preferences of interaction partners. And we told them, we're going to meet this person, and this person expressed these various attitudes. Uh, as a lavish spender, likes to throw money around, or is very frugal, likes to save. Well, suddenly the rejected people became the same way uh, in their own behavior, so matching their spending to the person they were uh, likely to meet. Um, as a, uh, the procedure people came up with where you offer people what's a, a, a delicacy in Asia, chicken feet, that uh, uh, looking at that, most people in our culture are kind of reluctant to, uh, uh, to eat that. And uh, so we had a case where the, the person sitting there, oh, you've got to try these chicken feet. You know, they're really uh, popular in my culture. You'll love them. Uh, most people said, no, thanks. Uh, but the rejected people were a little bit more uh, willing to uh, go along and try this. So again, consumption uh, uh, in a way that uh, you know, eating chicken feet was not that hard and maybe... Uh, uh, give them a chance uh, to uh, be accepted by others. We even had uh, a cocaine taking study. We didn't give them any actual cocaine, uh, but uh, we had them you know, rate in a scenario, what would you be like? Would you be likely to try cocaine under these circumstances? Uh, I suppose you were at a party uh, and a bunch of your friends got out some uh, cocaine and were passing it around and you'd never tried it. Would you try it there? Uh, or suppose you had a party and a bunch of friends over and they had some co cocaine and after they went home you found it left over, would you try it there? So public versus private and uh, um, you had accepted, uh, rejected and a, a future illness uh, kind of condition. So again, a bad news, but not, not tied to rejection or acceptance. And you see general willingness to try cocaine was low across the board except for the one group, uh, the excluded group. Uh, we're asking the, the public setting, uh, would you uh, try cocaine if everybody else at the party were doing it? Uh, and then they increased significantly, and uh, well, yeah, I, I would, would do that. So again, uh, consumption behavior aimed at, at, at reconnecting. Still though, uh, that's uh, behavioral tendencies and so on, but uh, what about uh, the emotion? Where, where's the emotion? Uh, I mean, we intuitively assume when people, as I said, describe these manipulations, they say, oh, I'd be so upset if that happened. <laughs> Uh, and we even documented when people imagine uh, being in the experiment, they report they would uh, be very upset, but, uh, and yet measure after measure, we showed no sign of it. If anything, there was usually uh, less emotion after the rejection. Uh, once in a while, we'd find a, a significant uh, change in, 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 in emotion, uh, and yet uh, these were not linked to behavior. So clearly the idea that rejection causes emotion, which causes behavior, this, this was never true. We were never to able to find that in any study. Uh, even if we did get an emotion effect, it did not statistically predict the behavior. Now one thought <coughs> is, okay, maybe they're repressing their emotion, uh, maybe they have, they're unconsciously really upset. Uh, so psychologists developed a bunch of procedures to develop people's unconscious emotional states, uh, you know, things happening uh, outside of them. Um, and uh, uh, what we found is no change in the negative emotions there, but actually the rejected people had an increase in positive emotions. Uh, which suggests uh, what's going on there is some kind of unconscious coping, and uh, you may not care much about this, but uh, uh, it, was, it was exciting to us to finally find something on, a, on an emotion measure. Um, but it was quite opposite to what we thought. It was not on the negative emotions, it was on the positive emotions, and, and that increased. So uh, it seems like after rejection, the unconscious mind starts looking for happy thoughts, that, uh, uh, which made us think maybe this, this, this lack of emotion is a temporary state, uh, immediate response to rejection, and it's while you, you go temporarily numb after being rejected, your unconscious mind is looking for things that will reduce the pain, you know, pleasant thoughts that you can have when, uh, when the numbness wears off and, and the thing starts to hurt. Um, consistent uh, uh, with that general pattern too, it is not just our la laboratory, uh, uh, Jenny Blackheart and her group uh, 
uh, did a, a meta-analysis which statistically combines the results of, of, in this case, almost 200 studies on rejection uh, just to see what is the effect, specifically on conscious emotion, is there an effect not uh, or not. Um, and uh, she was talking to me about it and she said, well, there's a, uh, there is a significant difference. Uh, for one thing, when you combine that many studies, you can detect much smaller effects. Uh, so she says, yes, the rejected people feel worse than the uh, accepted and even than the, than the control group. Uh, so she says there is a, indeed an emotional change. So, well, I'd been wrong before. Uh, so I just wanted to learn, okay, uh, what, what is it? She says, I said, give me uh, references for a couple of the papers that show the most emotional distress <laughs> after rejection. And she said, oh, well, that's just it. They're not really saying there are a lot of distress. The accepted people are happy. The neutral people are slightly happy because uh, life is good when you're in college. Uh, and the rejected people are pretty much in the middle. They're not saying positive or negative. Uh, so uh, well, we've got to figure this out. Are they really actually negative or are they simply shifting toward feeling nothing? Uh, you know, in all these different studies, they measured emotion in all these different ways. So I said, well, let's take everything and put, transform it into a 10 points or a 21 point scale going from minus 10 to feeling really bad to plus 10, feeling super good with zero as the midpoint. And we took all the studies that, uh, that we had with emotion measures and mapped them on there, you had to recode everything and so on. And we did, and it came out that the rejected people were right at the zero point. And sure enough, the uh, accepted people were happy at a four or five uh, you know, plus, and the, uh, um, the neutral controls were at about at a three or four, uh, so a little bit happy. Uh, but the rejected people were right in the middle. They were not saying that they were upset by this. They were saying, uh, in effect, that they felt nothing uh, and that showed up as worse than the other conditions, but uh, in absolute terms, they're, they are not reporting distress. All right, well, that uh, revived the puzzle now with much more data uh, that the immediate effect of rejection, at least, is not uh, emotional distress at all. Uh, about this time, there was a conference where people were, uh, uh, these guys had done a review of mostly of the animal literature uh, and concluded that. Uh, for example, rat pups who are kicked out of the litter and so on, that you know, being excluded, socially excluded in nature leads to an analgesia. You, know, analgesia. you become numb to pain. You lose the sensitivity to physical pain. So that made me think, well, here we're getting like emotional numbness and they're getting physical numbness. Could those be uh, related? And there was some theory there. Uh, Panksepp was the guy way ahead of his time. He was arguing back in the 70s that when evolution made animals become social, instead of creating all new structures in the brain, it sort of piggybacked uh, the social reactions on top of the structures that were already there to process physical pain. Um, so you know, being social is much more complicated in terms of what the brain has to do, but in, uh, instead it would make sense to just use what's there and, 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 and build on that. So perhaps uh, rejection would have some effect on the systems that respond to physical pain. So we started testing that. We bought a pain machine. Uh, which is much less glamorous. I mean, you're probably imagining one of those horror movie things. Uh, but it, uh, it just kind of puts a pressure on your finger and starts to squeeze it uh, slowly more and more. And the, there are two measures. One is you say, okay, it's starting to hurt. Uh, that's threshold. And then there's uh, tolerance, which is I can't stand it. Shut the darn thing off. Um, and we had no a priori uh, prediction of which, but uh, it turns out they both showed the same effect. So here's result for pain threshold. Uh, the amount of pressure, as you see, uh, uh, before you say it hurts, the people who are told they're going to be alone in life um, show uh, are much slower to say that that's hurting, please, uh, uh, I can feel that. Uh, and even the people who are told you're going to have a lot of broken legs and injuries and other th you know, misfortunes in life, uh, I mean, that should sensitize people to physical pain, but no, the 11 versus 14, it's not a significant difference. The, uh, the, the real difference is that people told they're going to be socially alone, uh, that uh, makes them apparently numb to pain. Uh, same result if you look at how, how, how hard it presses before they say, I can't stand it, turn it off. Um, so, uh, uh, so pain tolerance was clearly uh, affected in humans by, uh, uh, by rejection. And uh, the pain ratings were clearly, were strongly correlated with their emotional distress. So the more, uh, the more they said they, uh, the more they waited before they complained about the pain, uh, the more they reported no emotion as well. So then I thought, well, let's, uh, could this just be your current state or uh, could this, uh, could, is the emotional system in general? Are you just tuned into your own feelings? Uh, so I said, well, let's try a couple other emotion phenomena that have, have been done. 
Uh, there's this phenomenon called affective forecasting, which means predicting your future emotional uh, uh, reactions. Uh, one thing they showed, for example, is uh, college students are asked, uh, yeah, I, mean, I remember Case Western Reserve, and I know there was a football game of sorts here, but I don't think the students are all that in, investigated, uh, invested in it. Uh, Florida State's a very different matter, it's a big game, you know, and people care a lot about it. So we say, well, next month, uh, Florida State's going to play the big game against the University of Florida. How happy will you be? Uh, if Florida State wins, how unhappy will you be if Florida State loses? Now, the normal pattern is people predict really strong reactions. And uh, sure enough, if you look at the, uh, the top two lines here, the people who are accepted and the no feedback control, this is a scale from one to seven. So seven's as happy as you could possibly be. And they're at six and a half. You know, this is like be the best thing uh, in life that I could imagine to watch uh, our team win that game. And losing, uh, it's, you know, it's two instead of one, so I suppose leaves a little bit of room for death in the family or thermonuclear war. Uh, but it's sort of the next worst thing after that. Uh, and that's the routine pattern is people actually overpredict uh, the effect of forecasting. People predict much stronger reactions than they actually have. But anyway, you see that pattern is gone in the future alone people. They're saying, eh, I guess it'd be nice if, uh, if we won. Uh, but 4.7, point, they're really not even significantly different from the, the exact midpoint. Um, so failing to, uh, to, to predict uh, much of an emotional reaction uh, where everybody else randomly assigned uh, from the same population uh, predicts really strong ones. Um, some other uh, findings, uh, again, the, the, all, all the pain tolerance, again, closely related to the effect of forecasting. Uh, very little emotion reported by the rejected people uh, and, and so on. So my sense was the emotion system isn't working, so you can't mentally simulate future uh, reactions. You sort of imagine yourself watching the game and you watch uh, Florida State winning or losing, and then you look how you feel and you don't feel anything. So you think, eh, it won't bother me or uh, I, won't, I don't really care. You're not feeling anything though because the rejection experience you just had has numbed out uh, your emotion system. So, you know, well, that means maybe people can't understand others, can't relate to others, they don't, they don't have empathy. So uh, that requires mentally putting yourself in someone else's place uh, and uh, imagining, predicting what that person will feel. Empathy is an important predictor of pro-social behavior, that uh, we do nice things to others because we can imagine how they would feel and that they will be made happy and, and so forth. Without empathy, we lose a major driver of, of, of positive pro-social desirable behavior. So next study, we had people uh, read uh, a, a description like this. Uh, we matched it to their own gender. So if you're a woman, you saw this. If you saw a man, it was, I broke up with my girlfriend. Uh, but two days ago, I broke up with my boyfriend. We've been going together and so on, and it was great and all that. But uh, now uh, he wants to date other people. He doesn't want to be tied down to me. I've been real down. That's all I think about. So and people read this, uh, and they, they're supposed to rate how, how warm and tender and sympathetic do you feel uh, toward that person. Well, uh, the bottom two lines, the people who are told they'll be accepted in life and the, the no feedback control, feel plenty of sympathy and empathy for that person. The future alone people, not so much. Uh, substantially less uh, uh, in, the w in the sense of warm feelings uh, toward this uh, poor other person who was just jilted by the love of her life. Uh, indeed, uh, responses, we started uh, writing down what people said in this. So, uh, you know, the no feedback control, and people would read that, oh, that's so sad, you know, she came here with this guy and she loved her. Or, uh, and the future belonging, oh, yeah, that happened to me too, I can totally relate. Uh, here's an actual response from the future alone. Uh, <laughs> you read it for yourself. Uh, no, no sympathy at all. Um, then we wanted, uh, are they specifically unwilling to empathize because it's about somebody else being rejected and you're told you're in the, but no, uh, sympathy for broken leg, same thing. They don't feel bad uh, for that person either. Uh, again, um, reported emotions didn't show the uh, exclusion, being excluded uh, produced emotion, uh, physical pain, empathy, highly uh, uh, correlated uh, and so forth. Again, the idea is that in the wake of rejection, your emotion system shuts down, uh, and so you can't, you know, much of what we do is imagine this or imagine that, uh, and then see how we start to feel in that response, and that doesn't work, and you don't realize that it's not working, uh, that you're, you're not getting emotional reactions because your emotion system is shut down. Well, my grad student came to me after this and said, uh, well, if uh, physical pain and social pain are kind of on the same system, does that mean if we give people physical painkillers, that they would be less bothered by rejection. And, and I thought this was a crazy idea. So, but he you know, he'd done enough crazy things and some of them had worked. So I said, okay, we can try. Uh, and we researched it and we decided to do 
Tylenol instead of aspirin. I do aspirin, but uh, you know, we had to give people things at random, and uh, some people have reactions to aspirin. Um, so uh, we wanted to track uh, as you people go about their daily lives. You know, we do get rejected or snubbed or blown off by somebody. Uh, and how sensitive to are you to you know somebody doesn't answer your email or, or whatever? Uh, do you get what's called hurt feelings, uh, which is mostly uh, what, what people report when they uh, are rejected and you know, say, oh, I, you know, it hurt my feelings. It's sort of a comfort. I feel uh, rejected in some way, even though it's uh, again not a, a full emotional thing. Um, so, uh, in first uh, study, we had people take uh, one pill in the morning and one at bedtime. Uh, it was a double-blind thing, so they didn't know if they were getting uh, Tylenol or a placebo. Uh, and then we had them each day record: Did you have uh, hurt feelings? Or how you know? How did you did you feel bad today? Or feel rejected? Anything like that? Um, so, uh, much to my surprise, uh, day one, of course, random assignment. The groups were the same in their hurt feelings. But uh, and the, the people who got the placebo essentially stayed there uh, over the course of the three weeks. Uh, but uh, the rejected people showed less and less hurt feelings. I mean, not the rejected, the, uh, the people who were taking uh, Tylenol uh, had uh, less uh, and less uh, uh, hurt feelings over the course of it. So the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or outrageous rejection that uh, come along in daily life, uh, they bother you less and less as you, uh, if you uh, take a daily regimen of a, of a physical painkiller. Again, more sign that the two are uh, linked together. So, acetaminophen, Tylenol decreased uh, hurt feelings over time. Had some other effects too. Uh, their social self-esteem actually went up, but their other self-esteem, like their academic, was unaffected. Uh, they didn't think they were smarter or better students or more attractive either, uh, or overall change, but their social confidence seemed to go up because uh, negative feedback didn't bother them as much. Um, uh, we also had a, a study with uh, some uh, brain measures, and uh, for those of you who are interested in the brain, uh, these are areas that respond uh, to both physical pain uh, and respond to a, a social uh, rejection. Uh, that uh, um, we rejected people prior to putting them in the brain scanner, uh, and uh, they showed, uh, in the control condition, showed increased activity in these regions, but if they'd had some Tylenol before that, uh, that reaction was not there. So, uh, what we got here from the rejection and pain, uh, exclusion makes people less sensitive to physical pain, slower to feel pain in the first place, slower to both threshold and, and tolerance go up, uh, sort of object to it. Um, only the rejected people show this uh, uh, increase. Large effects, uh, much larger than you should get in laboratory stuff, uh, and uh, the pain medication seemed to, uh, to help. Um, now, uh, other, a couple more things before we wind up here uh, that uh, enter into it. Uh, we had some studies on the idea of money. Now, I, mean, I showed you pursuing actual money uh, motivated people to self-regulate. Uh, but uh, one of my colleagues has started doing these studies where if you just plant the idea of money uh, in people's minds, uh, make them handle money or see money on the screensaver or something like that, that this produces a variety of effects there. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this actually, the studies were actually done by a colleague in, uh, in, in China. And so she had people rejected or accepted by the group. Uh, nobody picked you or everybody picked you. Uh, and then had a couple desire measures of how much they desire money. Uh, one thing that's been known for a while is people who want money more will draw coins and dollar bills as bigger than others. And then she asked them uh, also uh, if we gave you a uh, uh, $1.4 million, I mean, that's the... Uh, American equivalent of what the, uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, amount was. And so would you give up sunshine or the beaches or chocolate or spring or whatever for the rest of your life if you could have all this money uh, and see if they'd do it? And then they were asked also for a donation to uh, an orphanage. Um, to have the, uh, um, so, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so, uh, to manipulate also the, the money thing, she had people count uh, money. So if they counted effectively uh, something like $20 bills, they're 100 uh, yuan um, uh, bills, and had them, she said, we've got to test your finger dexterity, and had people count those. So that they're such just handling money. It's not their money, or in the other condition, counted paper. Uh, got them rejected, and, and so forth. Uh, in another condition, we had them uh, rate uh, uh, how painful uh, hot water was. Uh, anyway, uh, what this showed, uh, was that uh, planting the idea of money by having people uh, handle handle dollar bills that seemed to also numb them out, 
uh, to the, uh, the effects of being rejected, uh, also reduced the effects of physical pain. And the, 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 the physical pain and social pain effects were very parallel through this whole series of studies. Uh, is it any thoughts about money? What about losing money? Uh, so she had people think of all the ways that they'd spent money uh, in the past month. Uh, so they're not thinking of handling money or getting money or anything like that. They're thinking about money going out. Well, that made things worse. Uh, that uh, um, so uh, people felt uh, uh, you know, more unvalued and hurt feelings and so on after rejected. Also, putting their hands in hot water hurt more. They complained more about it if they'd been thinking about uh, losing money. So uh, further evidence that the physical pain and the, if you will, the social pain, uh, social reaction systems are the same. Uh, they seem, uh, in this case, parallel uh, across the different studies. The idea of money, uh, we tried to get what, what is the psychological impact. Well, the only thing we could find that it, it, it changed was people felt stronger after handling money uh, and weaker after thinking about spending money. So it seemed to have something to do with strength, uh, and that makes people better able to tolerate both physical pain uh, and, uh, and rejection. Um, we, uh, one more study we looked at, uh, the startle response. So when the people are sitting there, <coughs> we recorded um, their uh, um, galvanic skin response. Uh, and then the experimenter sometimes snuck up behind them and made a loud noise uh, to see if, if they, you know, figuratively they would jump. Uh, it's actually the, the, the line on the graph would, would jump and show that you know, suddenly your skin is uh, uh, showing a strong uh, response there. So uh, some of them had been rejected uh, the cyberball is an online game uh, that's uh, sometimes used to manipulate rejection. You play this game where you're supposed to throw the ball around with other people, and in the one condition, they keep throwing it back and forth, and you decide who to throw it to, and they throw it to you, and so on. So it's kind of fun. Uh, in the rejection condition, it starts going around, and then the other people just start throwing it amongst themselves and stop throwing it to you. Uh, so it's, it's obviously a pretty watered-down form of rejection, but it does produce results, and it does make... Uh, uh, does bother people and, and produce these, uh, these effects. So we had people do that uh, and then uh, measured their response, uh, uh, the startle response. And look at this, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a, a mirror condition which turned out to make no difference, but uh, uh, over here the two high numbers uh, indicate uh, the, the normal startle response that uh, people in the accepted condition who played cyberball with people who threw them the ball uh, yeah, suddenly a loud noise behind them and their, uh, their skin records, oh, they, uh, were, they were startled. Uh, but that seemed to be numbed out in the rejection people. So even the startle response uh, is gone uh, when they're rejected. So there's a very strong inner numbness that uh, seems to happen in the wake uh, of uh, rejection. All right, uh, last issue before I close, uh, close up here. Uh, I've said all along uh, we couldn't find emotion. It wasn't mediating behavior. Uh, we've been struggling to get uh, a couple of the behavioral studies uh, published, the, the early ones people liked because it was, a, you know, wow, look what rejection affects behavior. But then they were starting to say, well, what's the inner process and, and, and so on. Uh, we couldn't find emotion, but maybe this lack of empathy did it. Remember, they're more aggressive. Well, if they're not feeling sorry for the person they're blasting away or understanding that person, maybe they're more willing to do something that would, would be unpleasant, would hurt that person. And by the same token, they're not being as helpful and friendly perhaps uh, because they're not empathizing uh, with the other person. So in this last study, and I'm, I'm still amazed that this worked, uh, we manipulated uh, with the, the future alone versus future belonging. So they took a test and are told people like you are going to end up alone in life. Uh, then we measured empathy toward the person who had been dumped by the romantic partner. You remember that study I talked about before. I moved to Florida State and my boyfriend, I thought we were all set, and then he he dumped me and wants to date other people and so on. Um, then we had them do a little task and paid them $2 so that they would have some money. Uh, and last, ask for a donation to the student emergency fund. Would you be willing to contribute any of the money that you uh, just got toward uh, this, uh, this fund that does a good deed for students in trouble? And uh, sure enough, uh, the we, we found the effect and it was mediated by empathy. And it's remarkable because remember they're rejected by one group of people in the non-specific future. Um, we're measuring their empathy toward a second person and their generosity toward a third person, the student em emergency fund. And yet statistically those are all very strongly interlinked. Uh, the rejected people, when you look at the top line, uh, they showed lower empathy than the other two groups, uh, replicating the earlier effect. And they donated less. Uh, to the, uh, 
student emergency fund, re re replicating that effect. What's novel is that, again, these were tied statistically uh, so that the one mediated the other. So we finally could say <laughs> there's something happening inside them that's uh, directly uh, uh, predicting this, uh, this behavior effect. So uh, <coughs> let me uh, just uh, summarize uh, what we found there. And that's it. Um, no, clearly, we're using uh, these are laboratory studies, unexpected exclusion. They don't come to the experiment expecting to be accepted or rejected. Things are a little more complicated when you know you're about to find out if you got into law school or something, and you know it's coming, and you're waiting for that. Uh, there, you know, there are probably some buildup of arousal there, so uh, things could be uh, a, a little bit more complicated. Uh, but you strip away all the other uh, complications and so forth, and just look at people who are participating, going about their business, and so on. And bam, uh, to their surprise, somebody rejects them. Um, uh, this produced fairly large. Uh, behavioral effects, more aggression, more antisocial behavior, less helping, less pro-social behavior, more self-destructive behavior. Uh, also uh, cognitively, uh, there's less intelligent reasoning, less logical, uh, less intelligent thought uh, in terms of controlled processes. All these make sense, but again, no emotional distress. Uh, we could not get them. Uh, however, we tried to report uh, that they're being upset. If anything, there was the uh, unconscious positive emotion. Self-regulation, uh, that seems to be poor after rejection. So uh, uh, we showed in the, the IQ stuff, the kind of reasoning where you have to do it effortfully, manage your, your, your mind and make yourself think thoughts, that gets worse. Uh, the, both the selfish and the uh, impulsive short-sighted uh, behavior patterns increased. Um, and then our, all our measures of, of self-regulating behavior uh, showed that uh, people were worse after, uh, after rejection. Uh, showed moreover, not that they couldn't, uh, just they didn't uh, feel uh, motivated to bother. Uh, they were unwilling to self-regulate, not, uh, not unable. Uh, we could easily make them self-regulate, uh, get them to do so if we offered them a reason to do so, even if we just made them uh, aware of themselves, that, that sort of starts the self-regulation process. But offering them a money uh, incentive made them do better. Uh, telling them that uh, what we were testing would contribute to being accepted by others, uh, even as just at a test of their social skills, that motivated them to do better again. So again, the, the deficit in self-regulation is not that they can't, it's just they, they don't feel like bothering. If they have a reason to bother, uh, then they can do it. So all this supports that implicit bargain idea. We regulate and we control ourselves so as to be accepted in society. <coughs> if uh, we don't self-regulate, society rejects us. But also the other way around, if, uh, uh, if we get rejected, suddenly we lose uh, our interest in, uh, uh, in self-regulating and trying to be a good person. Now, the failure to self-regulate probably contributes to some of the behavioral effects uh, as well. Aggression is often uh, <coughs> increased when uh, self-control is poor. <coughs> um, um, oh, sorry, I had one more here. Uh, uh, there we go. Um, and then the last set of findings, uh, social exclusion or rejection makes the body less sensitive to physical pain. Um, both the uh, tolerance for pain and the thresholds for pain uh, show a higher, remarkably higher among rejected people. And again, even with just these minor little laboratory tasks where a bunch of strangers you just met, uh, say nobody, nobody there in that group picked you to work with, uh, or we tell you years in the future you're gonna be alone and, and not have uh, friends, uh, that seems to be enough to produce an immediate change in the body's sensitivity to physical pain, uh, that it seems to create a, a kind of physical numbness. And it's consistent, again, with what uh, the animal literature had found uh, among uh, animals who were uh, excluded from the, the group or the tribe or whatever. Um, in, in our studies, uh, emotional numbness and physical numbness went hand in hand. Uh, so I think that explains the lack of emotional response. Uh, mostly the people report no emotion, and then the meta-analysis showed that that's, that's really true across all the laboratories doing this kind of work. Uh, and then the emotion system in general seems to shut down. So not only are you not having a feeling right now, you can't, you, know, you imagine future events, uh, you don't have emotional reactions, which is an important thing for guiding decisions. Uh, your empathy, ability to feel sorry for others who are having difficulties or whatever, that's less. Uh, the, even your, your physiological startle response to an unexpected loud noise uh, is temporarily numbed out uh, after rejection. And then last, these, this numbness uh, contributes to some of the uh, negative behaviors uh, that, 
the, the people show in the wake of rejection, the uh, aggression and, and lack of uh, helping and so forth, uh, that too uh, seems to increase. So in a way we found emotion involved at all, not the way we thought that uh, emotional distress would drive these behaviors, but really it's the shutdown of the emotional system among the rejected people uh, that makes them less able to connect with others because we use our, our emotion system to imagine what other people are feeling and to uh, care about them and so forth. Uh, when the system's not working and we don't realize it's not working, uh, then we uh, cease to connect with others and hence we're more indifferent to their, uh, their suffering, uh, more aggressive, uh, less helpful. Thank you. who participated in these studies knew that they were participating in an experimental study. They didn't think these were real results. Some of them must have had that knowledge because I'm thinking someone who is told, well, you're just gonna end up alone for the rest of your life. They had to have had prior experience. Some of them had to have had prior experience that would say, well, I don't really believe that my prior experience tells me that I'm a very social person. Yeah, well, we, at the end of the experiment, as I said, we debriefed them pretty fast. Uh, and try to see if they're having suspicions, if they out and out disbelieve it. Uh, you know, for people to be a little skeptical, that's fine, but that would have produced no results, and it's a little surprising we're getting these, uh, these, these large, uh, even physiological effects. So it's some... trend was to what yeah. the results were, but... Yeah. Um, and one, one other short sure. question. You thought that you might find emotions. What kind of emotions did you think you might see? Well, um, we believe anxiety is very much about uh, social inclusion and rejection, so we, we look for anxiety, uh, sadness, uh, we look for anger. Uh, we included, you know, we have everything from like global how happy to how sad are you, you know, on a one item measure, uh, to checklists where you can rate do you have any of all these different emotions, and we, we list uh, them one by one. Uh, so there are lots of different ways. Um, you know, in terms of the taking it seriously, uh, you know, people do know it's an experiment, but that's why you tell them it's about one thing. We don't say, come in, we're going to study how you react to being rejected. Uh, but we tell them it's a, a measure of a group discussion, and we've got to get people to know each other, and then you're going to work on these next tasks. With, so they're thinking that that's going on, and then boom, we say, oh, nobody picked you. This has never happened before. I don't know quite what to do about it. So we try to make it as, uh, as realistic as you can do. But as I said, in the social sciences, we need all the methods we have. And, and in that connection, it, like I said, it's very encouraging that uh, we get the same results as, uh, as uh, say, in the loneliness work, uh, where they showed, uh, you know, the poor dichotic listening. Uh, you know, there, they're taking people who are already lonely, and so they can't uh, show what's, what's causal, but they, they're showing people who are actually lonely in their lives. And, and again, we don't know if it's something about those people. Um, if the, the poor listening is what makes them uh, uh, lonely uh, or not, but uh, uh, the convergence across m multiple methods is, is the best thing in social science. So uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, I got you. Alternate sides. Um, has this been studied in adolescence, and would these findings apply to children who are bullied? Because um, um, it is a sort of verbal uh, rejection. Uh, yes. Uh, um, I, uh, I would assume it was. It's. Uh, I, I don't do work with children myself, but I've been to some conferences where people report on, uh, uh, on the, the bullying uh, effects. Now, <coughs> being bullied <coughs> is, uh, is in some ways a different kind of uh, thing than just being rejected. Uh, people tend to reject the bullies, you know, the other children, you know, not just the victim, but children don't like aggressive children, so there is a, a, uh, a rejection of the bully uh, at some point. There's some complications there. Uh, at some at some age, the bully becomes briefly cool, and the other kids uh, start to hang out with them again. Uh, whereas the one who's just deviant in some different way uh, gets gets rejected all along. Um, so uh, there are some negative effects and, and 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 cumulative sorts of things. But we haven't put the the children through this uh, kind of procedure. Uh, you know, it's 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 more complicated and more per permissions. Uh, it, it is being done, and as far as I can tell, the results are. Are, are, are converging. Okay. Thank you. Uh, has there been any research showing uh, how mindfulness might influence the rejection response? No, that's a cool idea. I don't uh, know. Uh, mindfulness does improve self-regulation, so uh, uh, I would think if you prompted people to become more mindful, um, 
that it might counteract some of the rejection effects. The, the problem is, is that after you've been rejected, the last thing you want to do is be highly aware of yourself. Uh, one study I didn't report um, was uh, we had people be accepted or rejected, and then this procedure where they go into a room and we say, just go in there and take a seat. And some of the seats, we have a mirror on one wall, some of the seats are facing the mirror, some are facing away. And you know, people are accepted, they, they go in, and students like to look at themselves in the mirror and so on, so they'll, they'll mostly sit facing the mirror. Rejected people, I think there was only one in the entire experiment who looked at the mirror. Everyone else sat back to the mirror. So it's kind of a sign, uh, you know, after a rejection, you really don't want to be thinking about yourself and so on. It might be a bit of a hard sell uh, to say, well, now is a good time to be, uh, to be mindful. So uh, hey, try it next time uh, you get a paper rejected or you lose a court case or whatever. Uh, sit there and really reflect about yourself. But that, that's really not a, a happy time to do. I mean, that's when people drink alcohol because alcohol is known to reduce uh, mindfulness and self-awareness and all those things. So you you want to blot those thoughts out of your mind. Sure. I, I wondered if you would get different results if you worked with people that were older than college age. Um, well, I don't think they would be opposite and that they would be happy to be rejected or that, uh, you know, that they would show imp improvements and so on. Uh, I s the effects, uh, I mean, this is a question we, uh, we, 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 we grapple with in the field uh, quite a bit. When they replicate results with older samples or community samples and so on, uh, the size of the effects differs, uh, but the direction of them tends to be the same. Um, and some people are upset by this, the, just the difference in the uh, size of the effects. As it may be in particular, young people are still forming friendships and, and so on. Uh, so if you took someone who's already very stably embedded in, in the world, it'd certainly be harder to do a manipulation, say you're going to end up alone in life after the person had been there for a long time. But uh, it still, still might get them, it still might bother them. Anyway, my sense is, again, the, uh, the size of the effects varies somewhat, but the uh, uh, the, the direction, not so much, the same, the same principles apply. Uh, are there outliers who behave differently uh, towards the people who reject them? And in that regard, are there, do you know if the outcomes of these studies might be different in societies that are more hierarchical or where people are more dependent upon authority? Hmm. Um, and the first, uh, let me take those separately. Uh, the first question, uh, are there outliers? Uh, in every experiment, there's some degree of variance. Uh, uh, when in the laboratory we're working with uh, weak effects, we often want to look for what personality variable might, might moderate the effect and say what, what kind of it, because it's a way of you know, even strengthening your results statistically and, and making, it, uh, making it more publishable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, these effects have consistently been so strong that we never really bothered uh, looking much. We looked for a while, we tried some of the obvious ones like self-esteem. We thought people with high self-esteem would be uh, more immune to being rejected. But no, um, the ones we measured did not, did not predict. Uh, so yes, there are individuals who don't show the pattern, but trying to predict that systematically from anything about you know, traits of the person uh, has not been successful. You know, men and women, high and low self-esteem. We looked at uh, you know, half a dozen other uh, things over the years, and uh, none of that has panned out. Um, now, uh, in other sorts of cultures with different social structures, that's a more interesting and ambitious question. And I, uh, I, you know, unfortunately, you know, most psychology is done in the U.S. and uh, and, and similar countries. I mean, you can't call it cross-cultural research because you have one study done in Canada. Uh, but so um, the studies uh, that my colleague in China and China did, uh, that's the only ones of this group we have where. Uh, they were done really outside of uh, a Western culture. Uh, and they seem to respond in, in, in broadly similar ways uh, to what we found. But uh, I would think there would be other things that would going on. I mean, I'm certainly not going to say this will, s will sweep all before it. Uh, but uh, the need to belong, I think, is, is basic. And, and regardless of whether you're in a hierarchic or totalitarian culture or whatever, there's the same need to, to connect with others. And, uh, you know, and, and, and given the, the physiological uh, level of response. Uh, I'm guessing this is a pretty basic aspect of human nature. So, uh, just say growing up in a communist country or something would not make you react totally differently to uh, being told that no one will love you or that you're going to end up alone in life. So I think that that kind of stuff still matters. It might matter more in a communal culture where people are more more tied in. Uh, then again, it might. Uh, 
you know, some would argue that in a communal culture you care a lot about the people you're, you're linked to and you have less reaction to others. So a study like this which randomly throws you together uh, with strangers and you're rejected by strangers, it might have a weaker uh, impact there. That, uh, the answer to that I don't know, but uh, uh, that's really not a, a you know, major change to the theory. It just means being rejected by some people that you might potentially care about. And even these you know, people don't care that much. These are strangers you just met. You likely never see them again, but none of them picked you for the task. It seems enough to produce big changes in your behavior, even though uh, you're reporting not having any emotional reaction. Okay, sir. This will be the last question. Okay. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Well, thank you. I have two questions. Is that okay? <laughs> Well, about this? My first question is a simple one, I think. Okay. Um, do you have any sense for how long the rejection effect lasts and specifically the emotional numbing piece of it? No, I don't. Uh, again, we don't want to let people uh, you know, go home and wallow overnight or anything like that. We, we sort of want to take care of the feelings of our participants. We appreciate what we do. and. Uh, and we ha I know one colleague tried to do that because they were looking for hormone effects, and so they kept them around for an hour. Um, but uh, you know, then there's what are you doing for that hour? If you get them involved in doing other things, then they, you know, some of that stuff starts to wear off. Uh, and the hormone effects didn't cooperate the way you know, we're looking for stress hormones and, and so on. So there's a lot of other complications there. Anyway, short answer is, is uh, no. We don't have a, a sense for how long it will last. Part of the question is, um, do you ha have any idea of things that may occur in normal uh, social life that are interpreted as rejection? You could say maybe a little bit more of that. That would produce similar effects to what the manipulations in your studies produced. Well, uh, like, like I said, things like you know, people don't return your email or your phone calls, or uh, uh, you see. Uh, um, you see, you see your friend who uh, you know, doesn't want to talk to you or uh, somebody forgets your birthday or whatever. Uh, people interpret a lot of those things as, you know, th that's what they report hurt feelings uh, about. So they, they, they feel, you know, it's not that uh, so-and-so, it, it's not that the movie we missed because uh, the person didn't come to go with me. It, you know, you may not care that much about the movie, but does this symbolically convey that you don't care about me? The idea of hurt feelings is the, the other person it's a sign the other person doesn't care about the relationship. Uh, so uh, some people are more sensitive than others to that. Uh, that's not my work. I mean, the only thing uh, we did there was the, uh, uh, the Tylenol thing, which uh, suggests, I mean, in the Tylenol studies, we, we weren't manipulating or, or administering any kind of rejection. It's just the, the things that happen uh, in the course of uh, daily life. But it seems to be frequent enough that, uh, uh, that after a couple of weeks of taking Tylenol, I think it was significant after day nine, uh, that uh, um, taking a painkiller makes you less uh, sensitive to those. You know, the obvious big things, you know, being rejected from graduate school or uh, from the fraternity you want or losing your job or romantic rejection and so on. Those will have big things, but uh, uh, again, suggest the first thing you should do is maybe take some aspirin. <laughs> 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 okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bo Meister, for sharing your unique insights into human behavior. Thank you, Professor Bo Meister, for sharing your unique insights into human behavior. Thank you. We have a gift to remind you of your visit. Yeah, thank, thank you me. very much. Oh, thank you. The reception will follow in the road, Tunda. <laughs>